My company, Albert Lee Seed, we've been proud supporters of PFI uh, for a long time. I basically, I'm here today because basically I do whatever Sarah Carlson tells me what to do. Um, and she owes me one on this one because, yeah, if it'll turn on. If it doesn't, I'll just talk about my slides and you can imagine them. Um, so yeah, when, when, I, when we had a conference call, it was like in November about this when we had the it was September, and, and they got to thinking about it, and they said, oh, we should have a session. And, I, and then later on, I got a call, would you be willing to run the session? And I said, sure, and I started putting the materials together. And the more slides I put together and the more research I did, the more I started to feel like I was going to be the drug enforcement agent in the room at a hemp meeting, right? <laughs> <laughs> because I've got all the rules that you probably just as soon rather not hear about. Is that working? Yep. All right, so again, Mac Earhart, Albert Lee Seed. So Albert Lee Seed House has been in business actually since before 1923 when my grandfather bought it. That's Lou Earhart there in a jacket and a tie. He actually wore a jacket and tie to work just about every day. Uh, and he came to work every day until he was 96 years old. Um, I don't know if that's expected out of me or not, but I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to hack it. He ran the business for many years, and then my father, George, took over the business uh, in the 50s and ran it, and you can see them mixing up some alfalfa. I guess they're probably inoculating alfalfa, or at least pretending to inoculate alfalfa there. And that's kind of an indication of what our business has always been about, right? So we've always been a very diversified business. Uh, we certainly have hybrid seed corn, Viking corn, and soybeans as our brand. But we also sell oats, wheat, barley, cover crop seed, alfalfa's, pasture grasses. And so the, that cover crop business has always been part of our business even before we actually even called them cover crops officially. So just a little bit of background on our business. We have at this point uh, 35 employees who actually run the business. My, my brother Tom and I are co-owners, but the business is run by 35. Really, we're fortunate to have a really great uh, staff. Hopefully some of the people in the room have, in, have interacted with them and would agree with me, but we feel really lucky to have a great staff uh, to take care of our customers. We serve, and I should also add that a couple of years ago, uh, we made the decision to focus our business entirely on organic and non-GMO. So in our Viking corn and soybean line, we dropped traded seed, and that's 100% focused on non-GMO seed and organic seed. And then in the Albert Lee seed brand, we carry oats, wheat, barley, and all the other things I talked about. So I'm going to talk about seed law, uh, a little bit, mostly about state seed law, a little bit about federal and then some practical considerations for that. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about intellectual property and how that, how that affects your decisions if you decide to get into the cover crop seed business. Uh, and I'm also going to touch on seed certification, which may or may not have an impact on your cover crop seed business, but it's worth being aware of. And then I, do, I did bring along two handouts. And uh, I would strongly, if you're interested in this at all, I would strongly encourage you to pick up the handouts. They're double-sided. and. One of them is a great handout from the Department of Ag, which answers some basic questions, and I actually have some slides based around that. And the other one is a sample tag and also some resources that you can go to to, to, uh, to learn some more about the stuff I'm going to talk about. So yeah, if you do have clarifying questions as we go, please raise your hand and I'll try to march through this quickly. So first thing I want to talk about is saving seed versus selling seed. So in Iowa, if you're farming, you're allowed to save seed and replant it on your farm uh, if it's a PVP variety, unless it's a variety that's licensed or patented. So obviously you can't save Roundup Ready seed and replant it. Uh, you can't save a licensed wheat variety and replant it. But for a lot of the oats and, and say winter rye varieties that probably you're interested in for cover cropping, you're allowed to save that seed and replant it on your farm without problem. At the point where you're going to sell it to somebody else, then you become a seed business, and now you need to start thinking about, you know, what do I have to do to comply with state and federal seed law? So seed permit, do I need one? So to sell, to be a seed business in Iowa, you absolutely need a seed permit unless, they've got two exceptions here, and I don't know if you can read them or not, but there's basically two exceptions. One is if you're a dealer for another company. So if you're a Pioneer dealer, you don't need a seed permit because Pioneer has a seed permit in Iowa. The other exception is if you are raising seed on your farm and selling it off your farm. So if, if all you're doing is raising some oat seed and selling it right off your farm, you don't even need a seed permit in Iowa. 
However, you still need to obey Iowa seed law and federal seed law. If you do want to buy a seed permit, and I, and I have a, a link to how to do that, um, any, any guesses on how much a seed permit costs in Iowa? $10. Well, that's not a guess. You knew the answer. That's cheating. <laughs> He's right. <laughs> so it's 10 bucks. And then after that first year, which is $10, it, it goes onto a sliding scale, and the maximum you would pay would be 1500 All right, that's what the application looks like. There's more to it than that, but it's a pretty simple form. You fill out mail-in and get your seed permit. Um, so again, whether or not you need a seed permit, you need to comply with state seed law. And so if you're going to sell seed, it has to be tested and labeled according to Iowa state seed law. So the test, and I'll go into a little bit more what has to be on the test, but basically they're germination tests and purity tests and noxious weed tests that you have to do on the seed that you're selling. Then you have to accurately label that, and the label has to reflect what's in the container. And the container might be a bag, or it might be a tote bag, or it might be a semi-load. All those things are containers, right? But there has to, the tag has to accurately represent what's in that container. And so you have to um, pull a sample of whatever seed you're selling, have it tested at an official lab. You're not allowed to do this in, in, your, you know, in the window at home in the kitchen. Uh, you have to done it at, do it at a lab that has a registered seed technologist, unless you have a registered seed technologist in your family, I guess. Um, these are some examples of approved seed labs, and they're on the back of the handout, so I'm not going to go through those right now. Um, and then some basics on what, what does it cost. So for it, the, the cost depends on the species. So rye and oats, which are probably the two primary species we're talking about most of the time in this room. Um, there's an example of what we pay for our seed test. Depending on which lab you use, it could be slightly different. So the purity and noxious weed test is $28 for a lot. That would be whatever you decide a lot is, and I'll talk more about that at the bottom, I guess. Uh, $25 to do a germination test on oats or rye. And then this Palmer amaranth test. So Palmer amaranth, as I'm sure you're aware, is a noxious weed, and it was classified as a noxious weed in Iowa in 2018. So what that means is you, you, when you do your purity analysis, or when you have your purity analysis done on your oats or rye or whatever it is you're going to sell, uh, they are required to do a noxious weed test. And if they find any amaranth species, they have to check to make sure that they're not palmer amaranth because you can't visually tell redroot pigweed seed apart from palmer amaranth. So you have to take some of, that, some of that amaranth species, whatever it is, and then they will test that genetically to see if it's palmer amaranth or not. And that's $25 a seed. And sometimes you only test one seed or three seeds, depending on what it is, because it's a fairly expensive test. So question down here, how big is a lot? So Iowa seed law does not actually define a lot. The way they do it is they kind of back into it by saying the tag has to accurately represent what's in the bag. So you would want to use common sense, right? So for me, if, if oh, I should say, lots are actually very carefully defined for certified seed. So if you buy certified blue tag seed or registered seed, there the maximum lot size for something like oats is 1,000 bushels. But if you're selling uh, non-certified seed, you can define the lot however you want, but again, you has to accurately represent what's in the bag or the container. So use your, use your head. If, it's, if you had an 80-acre field of winter rye, you combine the whole thing at 13%, put it in one bin, and, and the bin has air, and you're, you're keeping that rye in really good shape, that whole, whatever, 6,000 bushels is one lot, really, because it came off one field, and you can take it, one test off of it, and it's going to probably accurately reflect what's in the what's in the container, right? But if you're mixing seed from different fields or you're buying seed from different sources, every, t every different lot you're gonna wanna do, do a test on. How much seed does it take to do a test? Two or th uh, about a quart, two or three pounds. Again, depending on the species, for something like alfalfa, you only need half a cup. But for uh, oats and rye, which are the main two species, it's probably around a quart. Um, what needs to be on the seed label? So I'm going to read all this to you right now. I promise I won't. But I, the reason I actually printed this was I thought, it was I thought it was worth this little call out. The test to determine the germination must have been completed within nine months, excluding the month of the test. So you can't test something once and sell it two years later. You have to do it every nine months. Um, more, probably more useful is to look at an example that I have on the handout of what an actual seed tag would look like. and this isn't the greatest example because it's actually a brand 
and brand has its own special requirements under seed law, which I'm not gonna go into because that's even more boring. Um, but, excuse me, but the basics, whether or not it's a brand, the basics are the same. You still need a lot number, you need the purity. In this case, there's coating on it, which probably is not gonna happen for oats or rye, right? Other crop, inert weed, noxious weeds, total germ, probably isn't gonna be hard seed if you're doing oats or rye. That's more of a, something you run into with alfalfa and clover. The test date has to be on there. The grown is, is sometimes it says origin, so you have to put the state where it was grown. Uh, and then the net weight of the container, so if this is a, a bulk sale, this can be handwritten in. It doesn't have to be printed out on some official looking document. It can be handwritten in if you're scaling it across the scale and it's 600 bushels. And then a guarantor, right? So that's the person that's selling it. And that has to be a name and an address. Again, this is on the handout. Questions on seed tagging? Again, it has to accurately reflect what's in the container and it has to be backed up by, an, by uh, a test performed by a registered seed technologist. This is, a, this is the Iowa um, noxious weed list and you don't have to memorize this or anything. I just thought it was interesting to, to, to call out that there's two class, there's sort of two categories of noxious weeds. There's what's called a primary noxious weed and these are the, up here, that's like uh, quackgrass, uh, Canada thistle, leafy spurge, and now, it's, although it's not on here because this is a 2017 slide, um, Palmer amaranth would be a primary <coughs> noxious weed. If your seed contains one of those primary noxious weed, it is illegal to sell that seed, all right? That has to either be recleaned and retested or disposed of. You cannot sell that legally for seed. The secondary list are things like uh, giant foxtail, wild mustard, uh, wild sunflower. If it contains one of those secondary weeds, you, you are allowed to sell it for seed, but it has to be on the label, and so it would have to say something like 17 giant foxtail per pound would have to be right on the label itself. And you're only allowed so many of those per pound of seed, and it depends on which weed it is, so it's a little more complicated than that. I think in Iowa for giant foxtail, I think the maximum is 25 per pound or something like that. But the basic thing I wanted to call out was there's sort of two categories of noxious weeds. All right, um, I, this information is on the handouts basically. Oh, I did want to say thank you to Robin Prusner from Iowa um, Department of Ag. She was a big help in putting this presentation together and helped me understand some of the rules around seed law. And I also put uh, the address of the Iowa Crop Improvement Association in case there's anyone in the room who wants to actually certify some seed. All right, so federal seed law, uh, the only clause in federal seed law which might come into play for you is if you're transporting seed across state lines because then the, the requirement for the germination test goes from nine months to five months. In practice, very few seed companies pay attention to this, to be honest with you. There's, we get in seed all the time that has not been tested within five months. It's been tested within nine months, so this is a, this is a federal rule, but it's a federal rule that's basically people don't pay attention to. The bigger deal with federal seed law is intellectual property. All right, so there's three types of intellectual property that I'm gonna talk about, and I'm only gonna talk about it for seed germplasm or genetics. So I'm not gonna talk about uh, intellectual property on traits like Roundup Ready or uh, seed treatments or seed coatings or brands or, or, uh, la or, or labeling, trademarked, excuse me. I'm just gonna talk about the genetics of the seed in the bag. And there's three types of intellectual property that you're gonna run into. There's PVP, or plant variety protection, which is what's commonly used for publicly released, for publicly released varieties from land-grant universities. So those would be most of the oat varieties that we have and most of the winter, winter rye varieties we have are under PVP. Some of the newer ones, however, are starting to have uh, additional uh, requirements like a license, and I'll talk more about those in a sec. Patents are the next category, and I'll go into those in more detail, and then licensed varieties. So you might run into a variety of winter wheat or spring wheat, for example, or even triticale, which is a licensed variety, and it may not have PVP, and it may or may not have a patent, but it still might be a licensed variety, and that has, a, has its own protection. Uh, so what's the Plant Variety Protection Act? This was basically passed by the federal government as a way to allow plant breeders and plant breeding programs a way to um, capture royalties on the seed that they spent years developing. So they develop a new variety of oats, they, they file for plant variety protection, and then they capture royalties on that for companies that are selling the seed legally, and they're allowed to do that for 20 years. 
So it has to be applied for. It doesn't happen automatically. So just because you develop a, a variety don't mean it's protected. 20-year um, protection. Again, PVP varieties, you're allowed to save seed and replant. You're not allowed to sell it. Uh, PVP varieties must be sold only as a variety name. So for example, Jerry Oats, I'm sure some of you have heard of Jerry Oats. Jerry Oats is a PVP variety and the PVP has expired. So you're allowed legally to sell non-certified Jerry Oats, that's fine, but you have to call it Jerry Oats even though it's not certified. So you have to stick with that variety name. And then Title V PVP varieties must be sold as a class of certified seed. And that's most modern varieties that are released under the PVP system are Title V. So these are some examples of PVP varieties that you might run into in your farming operations. Again, publicly released oats, publicly re released winter rice, and publicly released barleys and wheats as well. I didn't put them all up there. Um, oh, I guess I did. So this, I threw this up. Uh, this is uh, required information on a certified seed tag. I'm not, again, I'm gonna talk more a little bit later about certification. The reason I threw this slide up is that if you do buy certified oats or certified whatever, you're gonna, and you look closely at the tag, you'll see this little section. And what that says, if you can't read it, is unauthorized propagation prohibited, US protected variety, seed of this variety may be sold only as a class of certified seed. So that has to be on every bag of, say, Hayden oats or every container of Hayden oats. It has to have that statement and it has to have that blue tag. So patents, uh, a, lot of, a lot of farmers and a lot of folks in, in the industry don't like patents. Um, I'm kind of neutral on them. Personally, I prefer plant variety protection. I think it's a, a better method of, of rewarding plant breeders for their work because it allows farmers to save seed and it also allows plant breeders to breed with the material where most patents prevent you from breeding with the material. But I'm not in control of making those decisions. So we have to live with patents. Plat patents are, are not something that are applied to seed very often. We, what we usually run into are utility patents. And these, again, often, often, ha, often offer a 20-year protection. Um, they require a license from an owner for any use. Breeders are not allowed to breed with that seed. And once that patent expires, it's placed in the public domain. I'm going to stop on requires license from owner for any use. So. Some people think, well, I didn't sign a license, so the patent doesn't apply to me. That's not true. Once you open a container that was properly labeled with a patent statement, you have agreed to the terms of, the, of that patent, whether you signed a license or not. So, you know, we went through this big thing with Monsanto when they launched Roundup Ready Soybeans in 1996, and everybody had to sign the Monsanto license or the Syngenta license or the Bayer license or the DuPont license or whatever. But whether or not you signed that license, you were still actually bound by the terms of the patent once you opened a bag of seed. And that, unfortunately, is just is the, what the courts have decided, for better or for worse. So examples of patented seed are most corn inbreds and the resulting hybrids that you plant, most soybean seed that you plant, many private wheat varieties, and uh, some publicly developed barley, triticale, and other grains. We're starting to run into more and more patents. In our business, Albert Lee Seed, um, we actually are, are we're, we're in the process of launching our fifth website. And on our fifth website, is going to be a way, we hope, for farmers to actually sign licenses digitally because we do so much licensing now for winter rye varieties and barley varieties and wheat varieties. And I'm, someday, I'm sure there'll be an oat variety that requires a license too. So this is just a thing that we have to do more and more of. License seed. Um, I guess I already talked about this in the last slide is basically what I'm saying. Lic a licensed seed is a variety that you have to sign a license for before you plant it. Again, whether or not you sign the license, you're still bound by the terms of it. Uh, and we're, I talked about how we're doing this more and more. There's one thing I'm missing here. Let me look at my notes quick. I can't see it. Um, Oh, I know what it is. So one thing I will say is you will run into varieties of small grains like wheat or oats, wheat or barley or rye that have a patent and a license or even PVP and a license, like in the case of ND Dillon wheat where you not only is it PVP, but you also, ha also have to sign a license before you're allowed to plant it. So you can see, you can run into two forms of intellectual property on the same variety. All right, this is an example of a license. This one's from LCS, which is owned by Lima Grain, and it's for a uh, winter barley, LCS Violetta, or actually two winter barleys. It works for both LCS 
Violetta and LCS Calypso, if you wanted to plant one of those winter barleys, you would have had to sign a license. So why, why should you care about licenses and patents and PVP if you're just going to sell some oats off of your farm? A <coughs> couple reasons. One of the, the first reason that tends to hit people in the face is that some people get in trouble for this, right? And sometimes in a big way. You can see that's a big number, right? Two, even I think that's a big number. $2,975,000 a seed company in northwestern Iowa was fined for, brown bag, for illegally brown bagging seed. That was not a criminal case, that was a civil case that was brought by South Dakota because that particular company was egregiously choosing to plant seed of known PVP varieties, save the seed and then sell it without, without paying royalties and without being licensed. And they went back several years and got a civil penalty against them. I'm not here to call out any particular seed company, I'm just pointing out that that was a really serious penalty and by far and away the biggest penalty that I've ever seen involving a PVP variety. Most of the time what we run into are, the, this, are ones more like the one on the bottom in North Dakota where one farmer sold some wheat to another farmer without having it be certified blue tag seed, got caught and had to pay $8,000 in fines and then the receiver paid $4,500 in penalties. So this is a thing when the state seed department actually gets involved and tests seed that's being sold illegally, you can be fined for this kind of activity. So you wanna make sure you stay on the right side of the law. The bigger reason, in my opinion, I, 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 yeah, this, it's scary to think that you could be fined for doing something illegally, and yeah, we don't want to break the law. But the bigger reason, from my perspective, and the, and the reason that I respect, try to respect intellectual property as much as we possibly can, is that we need to pay plant breeders, right? So this is Dr. Kevin Smith. He's standing out in his winter barley plot at the University of Minnesota, and he's been breeding winter barley for the last eight years, right? He hasn't released a variety yet because they, up uh, last winter in his nursery, I think he had over 300, 300 varieties and all but three of them got winter killed. So for eight years, this guy's been working on winter barley. Someday he's gonna release a winter barley. It's gonna be winter hardy and people are gonna be pretty excited about it. And when he does that, we have to respect all the years of work that he, that he put into that and follow the rules of PVP or patent or however they release it and pay the royalties back to the program that produced that winter barley, right? This is Dr. Melanie Cafe from South Dakota. She's, a, she's an oat breeder, or I don't know actually where she's from, but she's the oat breeder in South Dakota. And, she's a, and she released Sumo Oats, which is a great oat for organic farmers, we think. And she's out there every, you know, it takes on average seven to eight years to develop a new variety of oats. So if you have a variety that you like well enough to save seed of and replant, Chances are somewhere a plant breeder spent seven or eight years developing that variety. And I, I wanna encourage all of you to respect that work and to, and to respect uh, intellectual property for that reason so that we can pay royalties back to the programs that develop the new varieties. Um, our company paid $1.2 million in, plant, in royalties last year. And those weren't royalties on traded seed because we don't sell traded seed anymore, right? Those were just genetic royalties for all the different genetics that we use in corn and soybeans and oats and wheat and barley and these things. And, and that's a large amount of money, but I don't object to paying it because we have to fund these breeding programs. I'll get off my soapbox. Um, so what about VNS, right? Because everybody, you know, it's sort of a elephant in the room. Everybody in this room, if you're in the cover crop, if you've planted cover crop seed, you've run into VNS, which is variety not stated, or common seed. And there's a ton of this that gets traded and frankly, a lot of it is traded illegally. Um, there's the state seed department in North Dakota, South Dakota, and now Minnesota. I'm not as sure about Iowa, but they're starting to clamp down on this more and more. There are situations where it's legal to sell the variety not stated seed. So it's not like it's always illegal, but you have to be really careful about it. This is a picture of a, of a mobile <coughs> grain cleaner. I don't know for 100% that this is actually set up for seed, but you can imagine a scenario where this is happening on a farm where they're selling seed out of a bin, which may or may not be legal depending on what variety it is. So variety not stated or common seed is just seed that somebody is selling that's not, doesn't, that for which they don't know the variety. And um, if that variety is actually a PVP variety, so let's say it's Hayden Oats, even if they don't know that it's Hayden Oats, so let's say you went to South Dakota, you bought a semi-load of common oats, you brought it back to Iowa and you sold those oats for cover crop, even if you did not know they were Hayden Oats, if they got test, if somebody came in from the state seed department and tested them and found out they were Hayden Oats, you would still be in, in violation of the Plant Variety Protection Act. 
So you need to be really careful about where you source your seed from and so that you don't get into trouble. So I basically talked about, this is the actual section from that handout that I've got, and I already talked about the thing on the bottom, so I think I'll just skip ahead. So this is all a little bit scary, especially for people <laughs> that are just trying to sell some cover crop seed. And I, again, I'm not here to like hit you over the head with the, the intellectual property hammer. So how do you do it, right? So how do you find a, how do you do this legally? Because most people don't want to break the law and they certainly don't want to have to pay fines, right? So what are you going to do? So I would recommend personally, there's basically two paths. One is to identify a variety that would be legal to sell. And that would be a variety for which the intellectual property is no longer in force. Uh, it's either wasn't, um, well, I'll talk about a few of them. For example, Jerry Oats I already did talk about. That's an older oat variety. It's been out for more than 20 years, so it's, the PVP has run out. It's legal to grow Jerry Oats on your farm and sell Jerry Oats for cover crop seed. You have to label it as Jerry Oats, but you don't have to certify it. Same with the other oats that I've listed. You know, some of those are really old. There may be people in the room who've never heard of Ogle Oats, probably a lot of you. But some of these oats are still around. Barley, same way. You have to find a variety for which the intellectual property has run out. Same with the rye. Hazlitt is a unique one because Hazlitt is a Canadian variety and it actually still is under intellectual property protection in Canada. But for some reason, the Canadians have decided they don't want to bother to, to protect it in the United States. So you can plant Hazlitt, harvest Hazlitt, sell it as Hazlitt, and you're not going to be violating PVP law because is, there is no intellectual property protection for Hazlitt in the United States. Question? Sure. So, yeah. So is there a way to find out which ones you can plant? Great question. Uh, that's what it looks like. <laughs> so this is an this is uh, ugly screenshot from the United States Department of Agriculture PVP office. And you can go there, and there's all the different species listed. I clicked on oats, and then there's four pages of oats. And this is just one part of one page of oats. And probably most of you can't read it, but there's things on here like Jim Oats, which is an old Minnesota oat, and that one's available. You could use that one and, and grow it and sell it legally. And then there's things like uh, Chaps Oat out of Illinois. That one, the certificate was issued in 2001, so it's still under PVP. You also could just call Iowa Crop Improvement or someone that you knew that had knowledge of this. Maybe they have access to some kind of thing. But the way that I do it most often is we just look it up on the PVP website. And I've listed this on the uh, resources sheet. I've listed the, the URL. Yep, correct. Your problem is going to be sourcing, from sourcing the parent seed of Jim Oats. And that's why the varieties that I listed are varieties I think you possibly could actually find parent seed of. It's going to be tough to find Jim Oats, which is, was actually a good variety. Um, see for a second. I will pause here a second. So this is a big problem. Everybody, I'm pretty confident that everybody in this room is a fan of cover crops, and we all would like to see a lot more cover crop acres planted in Iowa and in every state, right? And so we need to help our state seed certifying agencies and our state departments of ag figure out a way to help us do this. In my I proposed something last year to the Minnesota Department of Ag and the Minnesota Crop Improvement Association where we would create a new class of oats that would allow farmers to grow an oat variety and sell an oat variety without certifying it, um, but still pay a royalty. Because again, I'm a fan of, of paying those royalties because I think we need to fund these breeding programs. But it, the royalties aren't that big, right? For most oat varieties, the royalty is 25 cents a bushel. So it wouldn't be onerous for somebody in a cover crop business to pay 25 cents a bushel every time they sold a bushel of cover crop oats. So this has not really gone anywhere in Minnesota yet. They're kind of thinking about it. They're slow. In Wisconsin, they've already gone ahead and done something like this. And then they've created a class of oats in Wisconsin called Classic Oats, which is a kind of a similar model. Doesn't have to have a blue tag on it. Can be sold as a variety name without doing all the certification work. But you still have to pay the royalty. So I'm hopeful that we can get Minnesota, Iowa, Maybe even South Dakota. I doubt we'll ever get North Dakota because they're pretty excited about seed law. But um, if, we, if we can, it would help if everybody in this room talked to the folks at, at the Iowa Department of Ag and said, hey, we really need a new class of seed in Iowa that allows us to be in the, to sell oats and rye legally without getting in trouble because we all want more cover crops. Um, the other thing you could do is you could certify the seed. And I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I think 
I, I'm a big fan of certified seed. We, we certify a lot of oats and all different small grains that we sell, but it makes the seed a little too expensive for cover crop, especially when with corn and soybean prices where they are right now. We need that cover crop seed to be as cheap as possible. That's just the reality. And we probably can't afford to spend this additional money to certify the oats because now instead of selling it for whatever, six and a half dollars a bushel, you're gonna have to be selling it for eight and a half dollars a bushel and you're just not gonna sell as much, right? All right, that's all I've got. So I guess I'll stop. Oh, I have five minutes left, but we'll, I will pause and then maybe take questions at the end. Unless somebody has a follow-up question right now. Yep. So if you did, and I, and this, I put that resource, I think, on the... Hmm. Maybe I didn't. It was on a slide, but I don't know if it, it made it onto one of my uh, handouts or not. But the, the, the agency you would contact if you actually did want to certify some oats or barley or rye would be the Iowa Crop Improvement Association. Just Google Iowa Crop Improvement Association, and they can take you through the steps. And these are some of the, some of the costs associated with it. So if you, want, if you have a seed plant, and you want to be approved to clean certified blue tag seed, you have to be inspected every year to do in order to do that. And that inspection is three hundred dollars. It's not just the. I mean, then you're going to have the additional cost of cleaning the seed, but you'd have that seed cleaning cost whether it's certified blue tag or just common seed, right? Question in the back. You can, you, so you're saying if in Iowa you can clean blue tag certified seed without being approved conditioner? Yes. Okay, thank you for the clarification. I, in Minnesota, you're not allowed to do that. You have to, you have, to have a, a plant certification. All right. All right, we're going to keep rolling here. How many of you out there are really thinking about getting into the cover crop seed business? You don't have to be embarrassed, just raise your hand. Okay. This is a pretty specific or specialized meeting we have here today because it's direct, directly for um, seed business. And it's really interesting to listen to Mac, and we've talked to Mac in the past, and we, we keep in very close contact with idols uh, since we're up in uh, north central Minnesota. Minnesota, northern Iowa, so north central Iowa. Mac, you got me in Minnesota. Uh, and this is the scariest thing. What Mac just went through, I lose sleep over as our business has grown. And I'll, I'll show, share a little bit of a history and what we, how we started and where we're at now. I really didn't expect to be standing here in 2014 or 2012 when we started applying cover crops. Um, but this intellectual properties and the laws, we are in contact with idols multiple times a year, and I'm still learning new things. I learned a new thing today, even, that we should be doing, probably. We're still legal, but we need to, to, to up our game a little bit to continue to be a, a, ahead of the, what's going on in the industry, and especially on the law side of it. <coughs> We're not the same as what Mac and the Elberly Seed House is. They've specialized in strictly handling seed. Uh, they do a lot of plant breeding, sell a lot of seed. We are basically, we're in north central Iowa where cover crops, no-till, strip-till do not work, okay? <laughs> You're supposed to laugh at that, and Mac is laughing at that. But I'm hopefully to show you a little bit is, is how, what this business, how it evolved and why we started it is because of where we're in, we're still in that mindset in our area. I still have a neighbor that comes up to me every year. He's a pioneer, I'm a pioneer sales rep and he buys seed from me and he says, well, I'm still watching you if the strip till and the cover crops work. I've been strip tilling since 1999 and applying cover crops since 2012. And he's still watching to see if it works. So we decided when we started this business that we needed to have a business that was unique, also to, to promote and to 
actually create a market. Because we don't have a market for cover crops, do we? It's not like when we sell corn or beans, Mac, and there's so many acres of corn and so many acres of beans that are planted every year, so we have so much market available to us. Guess what? Our market in cover crop is almost endless, I would say, for a while. Our Iowa nutrient reduction strategy says that we're gonna, we want to cover between 12, 12 and 18 million acres of cover crops. 12 to 18 million. That would take about 300,000 acres of cereal, right, to cover that. 300,000. It would sure inc improve our corn and soybean prices because we're taking acres away from that to be able to produce cereal rye. But that's the enormity. So in our area, where we didn't have the, the, the market there, we have to develop it. So we had to try to make it as simple as possible. What, I, what I've learned on the strip till side of it, many of you know me as a strip tiller, that it took a long time to get that developed. We had to make it easy for the producer and very convenient and very inexpensive for them to do it, to try it, and then continue with it. So we used that, that strategy that we saw on the strip tilling side and we started applying it to the cover crop side. So we, we want to become as the one-stop shop. I mean, we do have growers that grow rye and oats, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. And we're going to share some numbers that we've done. And I'm not here to gloat, and I'm not going to dwell a lot on it. I just want you to see how fast it has grown and what, how much more need that we have to have of businesses like with Mac or myself or whatever. Maybe even more of myself because what, we, what I'm working with is the actual producer and helping him to um, implement cover crops. And that's a big thing. It really is. Whether it's economic, whether it's a timely thing, the biggest thing is psychological. And so we try to make it as simple and as painless as possible. Um, a little bit about our history. In 2012, there was probably uh, five or six producers in our area, farmers. We had gone to a NRCS meeting about um, this weird thing called cover crops. And I really thought it was weird because I'd been spending all my money, energy, and time and trying to get rid of weeds out of my corn and soybeans. And here I'm going to be flying this stuff back in and making a mess out of it. I thought this was really interesting. But we thought, well, we'll try it, because we've been strip tilling and no tilling for a number of years, and we saw what the benefits was doing, what, what they were doing for soil health, uh, our fertility, uh, whatever it might be, our productivity. And we thought we'd try it. So the first, first year, we brought seed from Elberly Seed House in 50-pound bags, and I don't think there was any totes at that time. So we went to the airport and dumped all these bags into their tender so they could apply it with the planes. Started with about 500 acres. Uh, in 2013, we continued, did the same thing, uh, strictly aer aerial seeding. Uh, we all individually, producers would go buy their seed, bring it in, uh, basically coming from the same place, but then we would apply it, um, basically all aerial. And then it seemed like the, the six or seven guys that we were working with, neighbors, thought it was getting to be kind of hard to get all this seed lined up, and they said, hey, Dean, you're the pioneer sales rep. Why don't you get the seed for us? Why don't you bring it to the airport and you take care of it all for us? And so that's what we started. In 2014, I actually had a producer, I had a customer just uh, and a neighbor a mile away. He had planted cereal rye the, the fall before following corn silage. His intentions were to chop it the next spring and then plant beans into it, use it for forage. And he came to me and during the winter, he said, you know, my, my stand of rye is really, really good. Let's say you're, you're putting this cover crop on. Let's say that if we just we'll combine it, I could use a straw. That'll give me a place to home her in the summertime. It'll work great. Let's just do that. And, and he said, well, I think when you apply it to my ground and, and yours, you'll probably use most of it up. And that's what we did. We didn't clean it. He just combined it very well. We could get it through the plane. plane handled it fine. And that's how it all started. And then the following year, I guess I should keep moving, in 15, 
I had some more cattle producers real close to me and watched what this other neighbor did. Hey, that worked pretty good. Can, you, can I grow some rye for you? Well, was it? We, kept, we weren't in the business. We weren't cleaning. We weren't selling. We were still selling. We were getting customers, and, but we were still buying seed from Albert Lee or whoever we could get seed from and reselling it. But eventually we got to the point where we are getting so much rye coming in that I couldn't handle it on my acres or their acres, so we had to start selling it. And that's when we started, that's when we developed the business, which was in uh, 2014 is when we actually started in 15. Uh, in 2016, we started continually growing. Um, and I'll talk about a little about the PL, what's it called, the, the patent, PVP, we are still in our, our grower fields, and this is what scares me now, is all VNS rye. I have no idea if it is a specific variety or not. And that's what scares me, because we could be out of compliance, but when we are planting it for seed, on those tags it says VNS. So when we clean it and resell it, we categorize it as VNS. But I think in the future, I do agree with Mac, and we have to continue this breeding program because we're going to have such a demand because we're going to drive it. We're going to get it to go. We're going to need better varieties or, um, that will work better in our areas. We would love to see more varieties for Iowa uh, that would be better for us in the long run. So I think we're going to have to get back, and we have to find out or we as a business find out what our original seed is. And maybe they can't tell us, but this is what scares me. What happens if somebody comes in and tests our seed and they find out it is one variety? I, it was on the tag, there was no variety stated on the tag. And that's what we've been using. So that, that's what scares me. It's almost like our oat producers. Um, because we actually supply the seed for our cereal rye guys, but I don't supply the seed for the oat guys. So they call me up and they say, hey, you know, what's your bid? What are you bidding? Um, I've got grain millers in my backyard, uh, which is a, a oat pl uh, processing food plant, and they want to know what the price is. I didn't realize I could get in trouble because I could be uh, cleaning a jerry oats or w a newer oats that might even be protected yet, and I don't know. I've been mixing them to make it into a, a VNS, but legally I might be out of compliance. I don't know. So we're still implementing. We're still finding new stuff out uh, on what to do. Um, so it really scares me a lot. But as you can see, we've continued to increase. And what we've had also done in, this, in our business um, plan is we help applications of the cover crop as well. We make it as easy as possible. And we'll just keep going. This is sort of what it looked like when we first started. Kind of a jumbled mess. That's going through a rotary screener and then also an air screener. Uh, we moved up to a, a light foot cleaner, which is about 100 bushels an hour. When we handle about 25,000 bushels a year, that gets to be a lot of hours of cleaning. Uh, this is one of our, no, this was the original no-till drill. Uh, in 2015 or 16, we decided that the aerial of application of rye, and if you've gone to some cover crop meetings, is not the most consistent way to get establishment of cover crops, but it's the easiest, fastest, and actually a little bit cheaper uh, than what our drills are running. But we actually um, um, contract with, we have five no-till drills now that run after combines. We supply the seed to the drills, uh, so the farmer does nothing. The farmer comes in and just talks to us and asks us uh, to do a certain farm or a field, and we either ask them, do you want it interseeded, do you want it um, flown on, or do you want it drilled after the harvest? And then now in 2018, we uh, jumped up again, and we're getting to the point where we're about as big as we can be for um, cleaning the amount of rye that we have to and get it on in a timely fashion. We'll have a little over 1,000 acres of rye in production for 2019. Uh, that's one of our inner seeders that uh, we just started with this year. Um, the demand is growing so fast that even the local rye, of course our local rye was not a very good producing this year and nobody had very good small grains. The first years that we started doing this up until last year we thought we had the cat by the tail. 
We thought we knew exactly what to do and how to produce zero rye uh, until this year. We were averaging before that about 55 to 60 bushels of rye per acre, which is pretty good, especially when they told us that we could not produce rye in Iowa and get any yield out of it or quality. Uh, of course, when people out tell me that I can't do anything, I always like to try to prove them wrong. And until this year, they were wrong. But this year, our yields were less than 30. Probably our average was probably around 26 to 27 bushels an acre. We had some guys down as low as 10 or 12. It was, it was awful. And when the yields are bad, it's also bad for income for the producers because we're trying to produce, um, um, compete with corn and soybeans. It also makes our cleaning job a lot worse, a lot harder too, because once you don't have a good stand, you have a lot of weed problems. So this is our one-stop shop, um, sort of in the in a nutshell. A farmer will come into us, sit down with one of our people, tell us that they want 30 or 45 or 55 pounds of rye aerial seeded on my um, North 80. We take it from there. We actually line up the application. Uh, we, also we also take the seed to the airport. We tend to the planes. Uh, we also then uh, bill combination, because we pay the aerial application or the custom driller or whoever. So the producer, especially if he's getting government funding, has one bill. Uh, we also take the risk of taking it off the applicator's shoulders. We will take care of um, collections. We do that because it makes it easier for the farmer and also makes our applicators a lot um, more easy to work with, I would say. Once the application is done, then we will furnish uh, all that needed, the seed tags that they need if they have to go to the NRCS. And then we also offer um, as applied maps. All of our drills are GPS um, guided, so they have as applied maps so they can tell exactly what's been seeded where. I don't want to talk any of you guys out of doing this, but I'm sure going to tell you some of the problems we've gone through and some of the challenges we still face. And for the next few step, uh, slides, I'm going to talk about those. Uh, the first one, especially in cereal rye, is a timely planting. How many of you are from north central, uh, northern Iowa from here? Anybody? Okay. Uh, we had an awful fall. We were harvesting up until almost the 1st of December. It was very wet. Uh, we had six inches of snow on October 14th. I remember that because that's my birthday. And we also had another two or three inch snow in the first part of November, which uh, didn't g give us much chance to get the harvest done, and let alone trying to get our seed rye planted. I would say out of those 1,000 acres that we have uh, planted, maybe, maybe 200 acres got out of the ground. From what I've been told from the producers in Canada, North Dakota, South Dakota, that if the rye does not get out of the ground in the fall, we could, we could possibly see a 20% reduction in yield. Now, we're still going to get pretty good uh, rye if that's all we lose. But then every time that rye goes out of dormancy during the winter, we can lose another 5%. And it just continues to multiply and add to it. And we might not see very good production again next year. So that's the biggest thing that we see on um, the planting. Um, maybe, I should, maybe I'm boring you with this part. How many of you are actually thinking about having growers grow it and then resell it? Because this I'm talking about now is basically rye production, OK? All right. We'll go real quickly then. Overwintering is the other one, and we talked a little bit about that, is um, how many times does it break dormancy? And then how, you know, and I'll move right to the spring, is how late does it break dormancy for good? We saw that in 2018, our dormancy broke really late. In north central Iowa, we had three snowstorms, or three snow events in April, the first weeks of April. So our rye didn't break dormancy, total dormancy, until the end of April. Usually we're breaking about the middle, or end of March is when I would say the most of it is. And so then we didn't get the tillering that we needed because of the early um, breaking of, of the um, dormancy. So that's another crucial thing. And then the other thing was in May, we had 100 degree temperatures on May 20th. So what happened was this rye thought, oh my God, it's already July. 
And it started already, it was started in the reproductive stage very fast, and we didn't get very long heads, we didn't get tillers, and it was just a, it was a perfect storm to have a disaster, and that's what we had. And then the harvest. I know why they produce this stuff in the Dakotas and Canada. They don't have the humidity that we have. How many of you grow soybeans? Okay. How many of you combine beans that are 9% or 10? I shouldn't go that extreme. Let's go 12% at night, and you come back the next morning, and they're 16, 17%, or 15%. A lot of you. You can take rye and be at 12% just before dark, and it could be 17% in two hours if it's the humidity is wrong or right or however you want to put it. Because we saw where we went from 12% rye in the afternoon to at noon the next day it was still 20% rye. Same field, next pass. So it becomes a very, very hard or a long struggle of trying to get this harvested. Harvest is usually about the third week in July in our area. Usually you would say that doesn't mean that we have a lot of moisture, but this year again, of course it did. So we were bringing in rye that was 17 and 18 percent. On the business, we're going to switch gears now. We're going to go into the business side, and this is just the seed selling part of it. Um, like I already talked about, is to keep up with the seed laws, the royalties, and all that. The other thing is a germ and a purity test. Okay, I just told you our harvest is when. This is participation. July, the third week in July. We start applying, aerial applying rye the third week in August. One month from the time we start harvesting to the time that we are putting it in the plane. A germination and a purity test takes at least 14 days. That's not mail time. Do you see a problem here? Yeah, a big problem. We're cleaning rye. Uh, we actually end up dumping rye into 30-foot uh, uh, regular corn bins with dryer floors and stirators. So we're fortunate enough that we can blend it. We know exactly what goes into each bin. They each hold about 10,000 bushels. And we keep a composite. We take a test every load that comes into us. They are individually sent, or not individually, they'll, they'll, we'll put them, we don't put them together, but they're individually tested at a seed lab that's, that is uh, certified for purity and germ. But we don't know what it is when we're putting it together in the bin and we're stirring it and mixing it up. So we take a composite, or we take a, uh, we pro, like prorating it once we get it back. We know what the average, we know what went in that bin, so we take those tests and average out. So many bushels at 95%, so many bushes are at 92%. We figure out what our average is, okay? And, and then we also take a test as we're taking that product out of that bin to double check that we're pretty close to where we're supposed to be with the averages. And to tell you the truth, over the years we've done that, we've been within probably a half a percent. It works really well. Um, but it's always, a, I mean, we've had some rye that's down in the, you know, 70% range, which we normally wouldn't sell. But when you mix it in with some 95%, it works out really, really well. But that's the problem. That's one of the big things that we're working with is how do we speed it up? Now, we can do the wet paper towel test to give us a little bit of an idea, but we can't sell it on that. But we can get a general idea how bad it is or how good it is. But we haven't done a lot of that lately. So, uh, The next thing is storage. I'm talking about dirty and clean rye keeping that separate in the storage that we might have to use. Uh, cleaning equipment is the other thing if you're going to get into this. Um, I would suggest not doing that <laughs> after we've been doing it long enough. But we're in it so far now that uh, we've had to add these bins. And actually we're using the, the old cattle shed right now, but we are working at plans of building a whole new facility uh, for cleaning. This is our, one of our newest additions. We, we were finding all these clipper fanning mills. This is a big one. This is supposed to run about 500 bushels an hour, which would be great for us when we're used to about 100 to 150. Um, the other, the other uh, concern is the amount of transportation that we have to have to move this product in such a short time. It's unbelievable how much more we need. Trucks. 
if we're looking at 300,000 acres, we need about, uh, well, almost 18 million bushels of, of rye to cover. We're going to use all cereal rye to cover all those acres. That's a lot of semi-loads. That's a lot of applicator, whether it's drills, planes, or whatever. My other thing would be the pricing. I don't know how Mac does it. I, I, I haven't figured this out yet, how we price this stuff, because there, it's not a traded commodity. I thought we had it made when I heard that uh, Canada had a board of trade. It was on the board of trade, Cyril Rye, but as of December 1 of 2017, it's no longer there. But I think as this becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, that we will probably see it be traded somehow. I hope it does, so we have a consistent pricing program. Um, because right now, it's like shooting in the dark. You don't, you, you don't know where to price. You want to be as cheap as possible, um, but you still got to make some money at it. So we came up with this mission statement not too long ago because we were kind of flying in the dark. Uh, we just hired another gal. Uh, she was actually the project coordinator for a watershed coordinator for Rock Creek Watershed in northern Iowa, off the northern Cedar. And she said, well, what do you guys really do here? And so we kind of came up with this. We're, what we're trying to do is, first of all, pr promote conservation practices. But we have to develop the market, guys, before we can sell anything. So that's our first priority. And the second one is to work with a producer, whether it's uh, the actual farmer, and then also work with retailers to, to um, move this product that we have. So that's where we're at. Um, it's not been easy. And I don't know any, all the answers. Any, I mean, you might have some questions. But I don't know any, a lot of the answers. We're just going by the seat of our pants. And uh, with help from the idols and from people like Mac, we're trying to get through it. So any questions? Yes? And how many pounds of meat are we using for this Iowa? Drilled? Drilled? Um, the state of Iowa just changed. If, you, if you're looking at funding, before this year, they, were, they said we needed 66 pounds of pure live seed per acre. And that was aerial applied or 55 pounds of pure live seed drilled or incorporated. And what that means by pure live seed, do you know what I mean by that? That means uh, you take your percentage of purity first, and then you take your germ percentage and so you got to have, when they were talking six or 55 pounds, you're talking about drilled, 55 pounds pure life seed. If you had, let's say you had an 85% germ rye and it was 99% pure, you're probably looking at like a 63 or 64 pound rate. Just before we started applying this late, or late August, early September, the NRC, NRCS in Iowa came out with new rules. They said 45 pounds across the board, drilled or aerial, as long as it's 85% germ, there's no PLS. So if you're in Iowa, some of your local NRCSs didn't go to the new one because it came so late, they didn't want to change all their contracts with Equipped and CSP and all that stuff. But we talked to every customer we had before, because we had them all lined up at 66 or 55 PLS. And we changed everything back to 45 pounds. We were, I think our, com, our uh, composite uh, test was like 88.5 or 88.7% germ. So we changed it all. Um, so from now on going on, that's going to be the case. Now, I like what... I don't know if you were at the session down on the cover crops downstairs um, about fall seeded, and we, Mac talked about seeds per pound. I think the NRCS, the government's going to have to get to how many seeds per acre they require instead of pounds per acre. So, but back to your original question if you're not funding, uh, we have drilled down as low as 35 pounds, which works fine. We don't need the extraordinary high. When we are using forage, we run about uh, two bushels an acre if they're going to run that, or grazing. Um, seed acres, we run two and a half bushels per acre. What's the latest plant date? The latest plant date for us for seed acres, they tell us in northern Iowa, is November 1st. 
uh, for cover crops, um, as long as you get the drill in the ground, you can put them in because they'll be there in the spring. Right. Now you just won't get anything in the fall. What were you going to use, cereal rye? I would have still said put it in there, even if it gets frosted off, it's going to be there for spring. It's, you know, it's already got a root development underneath if it's out of the ground. Yeah. Actually, in our area, the, the rye comes off uh, about a week before the oats. It's, it's back to back. Yeah, because we usually have to hold our oats guys off until we get the rye clean, and then they can bring the oats in. Uh, no, you do the rye, rye and then you go to the fair, and then you come back and do the oats. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Did that answer your question? Um, and we're, and I'm here. This is you're here? I don't know if that, you know, moving this much a little farther south is going to make that much of a difference, or whether it's even in an area that, you know, is going to be capable of producing cereal rye. Is a cereal rye protected? What do you mean? I mean, okay, I get seed from them. Mm -hmm. Is it a common seed? Can I grow it, put it in my bin, clean it? And then resell it? And if Joe down on the down the road wants fifty bushels of plant for cover crop, I open the bin or run it through the fanning mill and say, Here you go. Mm -hmm. So the safest way to make sure that it's not to know what you Yep. You that I need a, you need I add, need yeah, you need, you need a lot of the, the good news for rye is most of the old varieties are not protected, so most of the time you're okay. There are some newer ones which are like Ken McGillan out of North Dakota is protected and licensed. Um, and then there's hybrid rye, which that one also is licensed, so both of those would be illegal to, to sell a seed of, whether you know any of it or not. But if you went and found an older variety, you could get it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So then what's the back of the seed coming back? Mm -hmm. And then I'm finding out that this stuff is sterile protected too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, I, I think the same thing. It would, take, it would take a fair amount of homework on your part, but you could probably find a radish from Sioux City. You couldn't, you couldn't take a trademark radish, like you couldn't go buy Tillage radish, plant it, and save seed from it. You'd be violating law, but I think with some homework, you could probably track down a radish variety that was protected. Some kind of common dicot. Yeah, um, to add to that is to move air through rye is twice as hard as corn. Uh, we don't usually start stirators until they're about half full. And the static pressure is higher at half full than when I'm full with corn, wet corn, hot corn. The other so, thing with rye and all small grains for that matter is don't fill up the truck and then roll the tarp and leave the barrels at night. It's going to be rolling up that tarp next time. You're going to end up with Who's got wooden bins anymore? <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's a guy that brought in two red 640 wagons of oats. What's that look like? Fine. It was. We had, I told him, he brought them in. I said, well, we'll try to, he wanted me to clean it. He was going to put it back on his field. He wanted it clean. I said, okay, we'll, we'll do one load. We had, to, we had to scoop it out with a pitchfork. <laughs> 
It was hot. I've never seen grain not go across a, a screener. It was, it was absolutely awful. It was still hot when we ran it through the cleaner, and we ran it through two cleaners. We ran it through a pre-scalper and then a, uh, an air cleaner. And I told him the second one, I'm not cleaning. But that's what happened. I said, what did you do? Oh, we backed them in the shed. Never looked at them. I put a, uh, the old fan kit. Yeah, screwing fans. That were in the old butler bed that mm -hmm. were covered with this in a large box with a fan on it. And I still wash them in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had one guy bring in some rye. Um, he had harvested it. And there was a lot of Timothy in it. I don't know how he got Timothy in it. It was just loaded with green Timothy. It was a, a 600 bushel truck. And that was the same thing. When he dumped it, it, it was hot. We cleaned it. But it took half the germ out of it. Once it heats, it just takes the germ out of it completely. And that's my biggest concern. And Mac, we're talking about, not biggest, about my third one, is with keeping the rye. Especially when I'm bringing 18% rye in, mixing it, and then trying to, to get it dry to where I just run air on it, but I don't want to go too far to lose pounds, but you got to keep it there and keep it in shape. So once you get it to that 12% uh, state of it, it's yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. You, you by running fans, you won't bring it up like it will come up in the field. Not no, it's not like that. But you got to get it down. Right. Yep. So whether you're going to run it through a, a drying bed or whether it's you know. Mm -hmm. Right. You need to run it through something like that and then go into a bin that probably has food in it that'll dry it still. Yeah, yeah. You can't, with the batch dryer though, you can't keep very much. No, you're going to kill a germ. Yeah, you got to keep the heat without getting below like 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. I, I think you need to do that with that. Unless you just use air. But then, I don't know. And then the other thing on dryer floors, you got to have a special small grain floor too. Right. So there is more ex expense than what you, you just can't put in a corn bin and so say. Right Circulating it. Circulating and whether it's just air or you know, put a little heat in front of the fans of some sort, whether it's a you know, and I, again you're not gonna use a lot of heat on one house for sure or yeah. you know, keep a heater set back a ways, you know, trying to you know, trying to keep it under whatever degrees to suck it into the insulation. Mm -hmm. Those hopper bins, we are gonna put fans aeration in them. I've got two of them sitting, what they're called, what are they called? Torpedo fans or whatever. I got a, a 2,000 bushel, you know, wet bin. Mm -hmm. and, you know, ben told me if I put it up, when I come in with the, the fans in the bottom, mm -hmm. one on each side, and, and that's how I dried 18% corn down in 13. Yeah, but this is trickier. I mean, this, this is a whole different ball game from corn. It comes down like that, yeah. Thank you. Brian, did you have a question? For seed? Yeah, that's all. Okay. In, in our instance this year, we were selling the cover crop seed for approximately 19 cents. That's what we started at, but as things went on, it went higher. 19 cents a pound for cover crop seed. Um, we actually planted some seed rye on your acres, Brian, up by Stacyville, and that was 25 cents a pound. Plus, we used a higher rate. We went from the 55 or four, yeah, 55 pounds to what's two and a half bushels? 140 pounds? Yeah. Yep. Yep.
Oh, sure. Yeah, no, that's true, and that's what we've learned last spring. We we know a little bit more now about what what the popula what the stand should be, how many tillers we should have. We know what this, the the actual environmental conditions are that doesn't do well with cereal rye. So we're we're going to do more scouting this spring in those fields, those thousand acres. We're going to be out there more taking stand counts and everything. So the guy has an option. If it's not good, we'll destroy it and plant something else in it. Yep. And basically they do that in the, in the Dakotas, but they usually use a price thing. If the price isn't quite there, if a bean price is better, they'll just they'll plant beans and not grow it to seed or not take it all the way to harvest. So yeah, that, but it would be quite a bit more expensive. It would probably be, well, two and a half times at least uh, the cost of, the, of a cover crop seeding. Yeah. yeah. Jim. What do I charge for custom cleaning? Not enough. <laughs> uh, 75 cents. A bushel. a bushel. Yeah. Sometimes that's not enough. <laughs> yeah, especially when you get into that. <laughs> yeah. Jim. How close are we right now? Yeah. We're at 800,000 acres in Iowa. Well, I, I, not the shortfall, but the, in terms of a win-win. In other words, this can create a lot of issues with the area that uh, could slow everything down considerably. Well, no, I think we can, I think we can vamp up, ramp up the production very quickly. I really do. And I really think, and I don't know if Mac would agree with me, I think we need to get to a point where we have carryover seed. But what's been happening is our demand has been outpacing our, in, our, our uh, supply. Um, but I'm getting calls. For, I got a call from a guy in North Dakota that uh, he wants to go away from barley and start. He's thinking this cover crop thing is getting really big. So there's a lot of acres that can be switched really, really fast. Oh, yeah. Uh, and what we're trying to do is bring everything together. And part of it would take us to have a, a, uh, a plan that's uh, feasible and, and marketable mm -hmm. for people to basically sign on to. And so you, you folks have become a major part of mm -hmm. terms of writing up Components of that. Yep. I think our biggest draw, I think our production farmers can, are noted for overproducing. I don't have a problem with us getting the, the amount of volume that we need. My, more cons my biggest concern at that point is cleaning and transportation and applying. Uh, unless we have a lot of farmers that go and start applying themselves. But in our area, there isn't a lot that want to do that. Uh, so that's how we, but then eventually maybe, and I've even thought maybe there's going to be more individually produced rye. I'll go back to everybody had the 2B clipper fanning mills, but I don't think the 10,000 bushel or 10,000 acre guy is going to do that. <laughs> I still have two of them. Yes. Uh, 
I told you I was a pioneer sales rep. I've been a sales rep since 1995, and I think I've felt that I've been on an island for a long time. Um, I think you're probably going to see some of that. I don't think they're going to get into the, the production of it. Or maybe I'm wrong. But when you bring that up, there's a huge network of facilities that can handle this. I don't think we need the storage part of it. I really don't think we need the sales part of it. It's more of the conditioning and the getting it to those facilities that we can use go from there. Now, whether they will jump on it or not, I will give you this. Uh, my last, I just took a survey from Pioneers on how they're performing, or DuPont. And on one of their first questions, they asked, what kind of services do you provide? And the first one on that was, do you supply cover crop seed? I have never seen anything like that on a DuPont Pioneer survey before. Yeah, that's true. It's true. Because we write contracts with growers that don't have a price on it. We don't. We normally we don't price it until we don't usually get a price until probably beginning of June, middle of June. So our producers are like Brian here. He's one of our growers. He doesn't know what he's going to get. Yeah, he's crossing his fingers. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, and that's where we want to be ahead of them. We want to supply the seed to them, and we do that. We, we do have a dealer network, and we also have local co-ops that buy the, the seal rye from us, and they buy the other from Albert Lee or whatever. Um, a little bit, because we get a little bit of kickback from the applicators because we, we, handle, we shoulder all the risk. So we get so much an acre. No, not cleaning conditioning. I'm talking storage and, storage and selling. Because every one of those companies he talked about has a huge network of salesmen. So that's a need there is cleaning conditioning. Yes. But then you get into this whole, yeah. we get into this real gray area and... And don't plant rye on rye. Not good. Yes, in the back. Your numbers look great. It's all the seed you say. Oh, well, thank you. What's going to happen next? Are you going to keep going? Do you have lines going on that? Or yeah. I mean, where are you going to go with the business? Uh, right now, we're in the, uh, in the process of developing a network. And what we're trying to do is develop hubs like we are. They'll actually uh, service the customer, have the one-stop shop. And then we also have dealers underneath us that actually send us maps of, and then we can apply it. But anyway, we're trying to set up a series of those and try to continue to increase the business. 
and we're moving into place. And I didn't tell you that we spent a lot of time putting on meetings trying to, de to develop this market. And it really starts at tillage. That's where it all starts, guys, because not too many people can make this work in a full width tillage and have cover crops. They'll do it one or two years and I said, that's a heck, that's enough of that. So we're, we're hoping to, um, I don't know where it's gonna go. Um, the first few years, of course, we doubled. Last year we were a 30 some percent increase. I'm hoping that we continue at that pace for the next uh, nine to 10 years. I have a son that just came back. Um, he's uh, 37 years old. I'd love to have him continue the business. So, nice, good question. I, I, I can't answer that. I never, like I said, I never expected to be standing here in front of you talking about this thing in 2012. <laughs> Um, no, we haven't because to roller crimp, that means it has to get into the dose or not, uh, into the boot stage. And in that case, it's at the end of May for us. Not too many people want to plant corn and beans at the end of May. Um, in my case, since we do a lot of strip tilling, we have a lot of strip tilling to do in the spring, we plant the end of May and it does work for us. But uh, no, I don't think that'd be a big, not for us in Northern Iowa. I don't <coughs> there are new versions of that system where they actually plant the beans into their mm -hmm. oven and come back and roll their crimp a yep. couple weeks later. So there, it remains to be seen how that system will work out. But yep. there, there are some new things happening there. If you notice, I had a question mark on what the future ways. We still haven't got this thing figured out because we need a consistent stand. And the planes aren't giving us that. We, we've, all, we've also kidded about taking our drills and going around bordering all the fields that the planes are hitting and missing in the fall, but we don't have enough time for that. Because the planes do miss a lot along the edges. But, um, it, as far as your stand is concerned, um, it seems that uh, you have much of an issue of, you, you say you got five different people that drill it for you, I believe. Mm -hmm. You have much of an issue of the time limits with them. You, you know, mm -hmm. they seem to emphasize, and you said, ideally you could follow the combine, mm -hmm. you, you put them down, but you feel like you, you got If, if we, have, we have a problem with that, they don't do, they, they don't work for us anymore. Uh, we had three days to put over 4,000 acres in last year with three drills. Those three ran 24 hours a day, never stopped until they were done. So I have to say our custom guys that we hired knew, know what they have to do and they're willing to do it. And I wouldn't even go that far. It's more if there is a group of guys or there's a camaraderie or they kind of like-minded, that helps. It, what we call the early adopters. And then you'll have an area. I live in one. I live in an area that we do really well. The Rock Creek watershed has really been taunted highly what we do. But I can go three miles to the east of me and there's nothing going on. We're in the uh, Saragorda County, Worth County, and they say, well, we gotta make it black, we can't have cover crops and all that stuff. I mean, it's right, it's unbelievable. Now, we're, st we're st so what we're doing is we're concentrating, you asked about where our business is going, that's where we're headed. Uh, we're actually, uh, my gal is setting up meetings in, in Mason City, Saragorda County, in the Worth County area, just to talk, start teaching them or getting them ready to switch maybe their tillage practices so then we can talk about the cover crops. Well, they did that in the 60s. They went away from the rule book policy in the 60s. Turned them into a plow guy. He, he was stuck on the plow. The area now it's like you go to the rule book plow track out there. I have guys still mowing plowing. The neighbor that I started out the presentation said that I'm still watching and he's still mowing boards plowing. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I would say on our, our new customer bases, 95% of them, gets they get cost share, okay? 
I think the co I've always been preaching against the cost share for like the cover crops, the no tilling, the no or the strip tilling, because I think I can prove to the producer that he, we will give him a return for his money. Um, Jim is in the audience, and because he's he was the mayor of Charles City, which was on the Cedar River, the things that we needed to concentrate on, I thought at first was the edge of field, the saturated buffers, the bioreactors, the wetlands, all that stuff that really benefits our water quality but does not return anything to us as a producer. I've changed that because as we've been in this business long enough to attract new business into the cover crop arena, the cost sharing really, really helps. I would almost say 100% of my new guys that we do are getting cost share, but not all of them, so I gotta say 95%. After we get them started, whether they're on a three-year program, one-year program, or five, um, we will see them going away from that since they don't get the cost sharing. So out of the whole, um, our whole business, probably we're down to about 80, 75% of it's probably cost shared. Yeah. Oh, time. <laughs> Yeah, if you want one more, that's fine. No, you're talking about money-wise now, right? No. Yep. 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 There's a. Yeah. And a great example is like our, our Rock Creek watershed, when that was developed in 2014, we got a $2 million grant. And so they can divvy up so much money every year. And that's only about $10 for cover crops. And it's only on like 200 acres. But we will get them started with the 200 acres. And then as we get them to liking it or getting comfortable with it. Yep, nope. No, I, I don't see that. Of course, I guess I wouldn't work with anybody that, that would not do it because of the cost at that point, see? Yeah. Thank you very much.